Well, we're in week number three of a four-week series of messages called uh, No Fooling. We are studying foolishness so that we can avoid it. We're studying wisdom. You know, there are so many uh, resources in the Bible to understand what wisdom is all about. Uh, in fact, there's a whole section. The Bible is not a book. It's a library. And there are 66 books in the library. And one of the sections of that is the wisdom section. And the heart of the wisdom section is the book of Proverbs. And I've challenged you to read through the book of Proverbs with me uh, through the 31 days of this series. If you haven't started yet, it's easy to catch up. We're about halfway there. So you can start reading two a day. If you, uh, That's one way to do it. Or you can just pick up and start reading a chapter a day for the next month. Uh, if, you, if you're a little behind, you can catch up and, uh, and learn what uh, the wisest man in the Old Testament had to say about wisdom. But we said in week one that even he had bouts of foolishness. And we talked about everybody plays the fool sometimes. You know, foolishness is easy to see in somebody else, a little harder to see in ourselves. Sometimes in the rearview mirror, we can look back and say, ooh, I shouldn't have bought that. Ooh, I shouldn't have dated that person. Ooh, I shouldn't, you know, whatever it was. But uh, sometimes in real time, it's hard to understand. That's why we're in the study of, of fools and foolishness. So we can understand in real time what foolishness is and how to, and how to avoid it. And then um, in, in last week, we looked at, uh, you know, what does a fool believe? And, uh, and we said fools believe in, um, uh, in self-assurance over self-improvement. Reacting instead of responding, sacrificing the ultimate for the immediate. But here's the good news. Foolishness is not genetic. Okay? It's environmental. It's environmental. In fact, it's even, we might say, contagious. Where you have one fool, you usually have another. And usually there's a whole uh, chain of fools. Shelly, can you help us out? Ben, can you help us out? You told me 
much too strong. I'm added to your chain, chain, chain. 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 Got flashlights out, Jeff. That's awesome. Aretha's got nothing on you. Uh, Shelly, that's, that's, that's awesome. Chain of Fools, that's the message today. Now, uh, because it's Veterans Day week, I, I did some research, and by research, I mean I Googled it. Uh, uh, military wisdom. I thought I'd start out with some military wisdom today, okay? Uh, if you see a bomb technician running, try to keep up with him. If the enemy is in range, so are you. No battle plan survives first contact with the enemy. That kind of reminds me of Mike Tyson saying everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face. General James Mattis said, engage your brain before you engage your weapon. Norman Schwarzkopf said, leadership is a potent combination of character and strategy, but if you must be without one, be without strategy. Dwight Eisenhower said, in preparation for battle, I've always found that plans are useless but planning is indispensable. William Penn said, No man is uh, fit to command another who has not first commanded himself. Christian apologist G.K. Chesterton, Chesterton said, The true soldier fights not because he hates what's in front of him, but because he loves what's behind him. And Calvin Coolidge said, A nation which forgets its defenders will itself be forgotten. I'm going to put that list on my blog if you want a copy of any of those. Um, any of those, those pearls of wisdom. I appreciate the Chain of Fools song. Um, you know, a, a, lot of, a lot of advice, a lot of wisdom is in music, and also some of the worst advice you'll ever find is in music. You know, let's see, Stephen, Stephen Still says, well, there's a rose in the fisted glove, and the eagle flies with the dove. If you can't be with the one you love, honey, do what? Horrible advice. Horrible advice. You'll blow up your whole world doing that. Do not do that. Uh, Luther Ingram, if loving you is wrong, I don't want to be right. In other words, cheating feels so good, let's not think about how many lives we're destroying in the process. Horrible advice. Not wise. The police, every breath you take, every move you make, every bond you break, every step you take, I'll be watching you. That's called stalking. Don't do that. Be like Elsa, let it go, let it go. That's, uh, that's better advice. You know, uh, like uh, the Bible itself, Proverbs is all about relationships. And wisdom and foolishness is tied up in our uh, relationships. That's why we usually see chains of fools. Um, if you've been reading through the book of Proverbs with me, you've probably discerned that much of it is fatherly advice. It's in the voice of a father speaking to his son. Now, if you keep reading, you're going to get to Proverbs 31, and you'll get the words of a mother to her son. Uh, King Lemuel remembers the words her, his mother spoke to him, saying, hey, um, as a king, don't go, don't go uh, chasing after a lot of women. Uh, as a king, don't, don't seek after wine and beer. As a king, be sure to administer justice, treat the poor fairly. She wanted him to be a good king. Uh, he, she knew that he would have access to many more things than what was actually good for him. And so he needed to edit his life. He needed to live, uh, he needed to live in discipline. The fatherly voice in Proverbs warns against uh, the seductions of sex, easy money, power. Uh, he tells his son what we tell our own children. Be careful who you hang around. Don't just uh, jump on everything that feels good. Really consider, really honor the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Because it's easy to be a fool. It, we just come by it natural, okay? It's harder to walk in wisdom. And our relationships play a big piece of that. Let's look at Proverbs 13, 20. 
key verse, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. If you walk with the wise, you're going to be wise. If you hang out with fools, you're going to, you're going to be a fool. That's just part of the uh, environment uh, in, which, in which we live. Now, I grew up in Dixie. Uh, I grew up in Illinois, but I grew up in Dixie. Some people don't realize that Dixie extends into southern Illinois. I grew up between the uh, boot heel of Missouri and western Kentucky. We put sugar in our tea. Uh, we don't drink uh, sugar. We, drink, we don't drink pop. We drink, uh, we, we drink soda instead of pop, rather. We... Uh, my mom has a big magnolia tree in her front yard. A couple miles from where I grew up, there's a, the, a big cypress swamp, um, pecan trees everywhere. It's just different. It's just different. And so some people, you know, over the last 11 years I've lived here have commented that I have a bit of a southern accent. But guess what? I lived in Georgia for three years. And I had a thick southern accent. It got worse because I was living in Georgia, or better, as they would call it better, okay? I would, I, you know, depending on your perspective. But I, I tell you what, I, I noticed that my kids became bilingual. They would uh, speak really deep Southern at school, and they would come home, and they would talk like us, which is just a little bit hick, all right? <laughs> uh, my daughter Hannah came home. She went to kindergarten in Georgia, and my mom was visiting. And said, well, Hannah, what did you learn in school today? So, said, oh, we learned about needs and wants. Said, won't? What's a won't? Well, a won't when you want something, but you don't actually have to have it. So we call it a won't. All right? They, they could go in and out. And I noticed when I preached to Georgians, I preached in more of a southern accent. It's just because we, we all do this, right? We become, what we, uh, we become what we hang around. It's just a natural uh, part of life. Uh, if you walk with the wise, you become wise. The companion of fools suffers harm. Steve Blandino says walking with the wise means being intentional about fostering relationships. It, it, there's some intentionality implied in walking with someone. Uh, we need to walk with people who love God, love others, have a learning attitude, have a humble heart, have a moral life, ability to listen, a strong work ethic. Uh, walking also means frequent connection. If you walk with somebody, that means you're in constant relationship with them, continued relationship. You check in frequently. You know, uh, Thanksgiving's a great meal, but it's really the daily supper table that really shapes us. And, uh, you know, that's why we believe in life groups here at this church, because we do life together. We get with people that are trying to head the same direction we're trying to head, and, uh, and that's a powerful thing. And walking with the wise also means you're going someplace. Walk with the wise, you'll become wise. Be with people who are going someplace. And going to a place that you want to go. If you want to improve your marriage, uh, hang around with a couple that has a great marriage. Be friends with people. That If, if you want to improve your prayer life, Man, get with a prayer warrior and just come alongside and say, hey, let's get together and, and let's pray. If you want to know the Bible better, be around people that talk Scripture and read Scripture and study Scripture and Sunday school class and small groups. Uh, do that kind of stuff because that's formative. It, it shapes the way that we, we think and act. Um, the companion of fools suffers harm. That means you're not going to soar with the eagles if you uh, hang around with the turkeys. And you say, well, Pastor Chris, didn't Jesus eat and drink with sinners? Yes, he did. But he did life with his disciples. When Jesus went into a party, uh, like he often did, like Matthew, the party that Matthew uh, threw, he was trying to get to know people to call them out into something new. He wasn't coming to wallow in what they were doing. So, um, so that's an environmental factor. Our relationships play such a key part in whether we're going to walk wisely or, or walk foolishly. Another environmental factor in foolishness is, is our proximity to uh, temptation. Let's look at Proverbs 5, starting at verse 15. Fatherly advice, get wisdom. Oh, here we go. Now oh, here it is. Proverbs 5. We're skipped some. I know, I, know, uh, I know Linda. I'm skipping around a little. I'm trying to keep Linda on her toes back there. I'm, I think she naps. I'm, no, she doesn't. She doesn't. <laughs> Drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. This is actually relationship advice. It's 
using the analogy of water. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. What are you talking about here, all this water? Then he just explains it. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? For a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him, and he is held fast in the cords of his sin. He dies for lack of discipline, and because of his great folly, he is led astray. You know, so much of Proverbs is, be careful little lips what you say, and be careful little feet where you go. And uh, don't put yourself in proximity to uh, temptation. And, you know, there's that whole, uh, kind of that whole episode in Proverbs 7, if you read through, about, you know, the, the young man that finds himself at the door of an adulteress, and she kind of lures him in. But then there's, there's, um, there's Proverbs chapter 8 that talks about wisdom. Call, wisdom is described as in female terms, and she's calling, hey, hey, come and, Come and, and be wise. Come, you know, wisdom is calling out. And it's really clear as you read Proverbs, there's a competition for our soul. And we're not neutral parties in that. We have a part to play. And so, you know what, if you, sometimes we, we are all guilty of this, right? Self-sabotage. We put ourselves in bad situations where bad decisions happen. We talk to our school kids about this, but it's true of adults as well. You know, I heard about a guy that was trying to diet and there was a bakery between his home and his workplace. And, you know, he'd just stop in there too often. He tried to stay away. And so one day he, was, he just prayed. He said, Lord, if you want me to stop in the bakery, just let a parking spot just be open right there and right in front of it. And, um, and he said, sure enough, the eighth time around the block, it was, it was, it was right there. Okay, uh, let's not circle the block on things that, uh, you know, sometimes you just have to get busy with, uh, with something else. Uh, you know, what do you watch on TV? What, do you, what are your inputs in your mind? What are your inputs in your heart? Are you filling up with positive things? Are, do your inputs and your relationships reflect where you're trying to go in life? Or do they, are they really leading you somewhere else? Uh, you know, Proverbs really calls us to edit our lives in a positive direction. And, um, and, and that's why um, Proverbs has so much to say about discipline. Discipline is a negative feeling sometimes, but it's a, it's a very positive word in Scripture. There's so much in Scripture about discipline. Discipline is an unpleasant thing with pleasant results. Here's what it says in Proverbs 19, 18. Discipline your son, for there is hope. Do not set your heart on putting him to death. Now, there's two ways to take that proverb. One is, uh, I know you really want to kill your teenage son, but don't. Uh, just discipline him instead. There is hope that they'll actually turn into something. You know, somebody told me when I was raising my kids, they said, grandchildren are God's reward for not killing your teenager. So I said, okay, I, you know, I, I'll, I'll hang on to that. I'll hang on to that hope. The other sense is that when we don't discipline, we're really putting our children to death when, when we don't uh, have discipline in their lives. Uh, because discipline is such a necessary thing to keep us on the path. Uh, we limit our children's future when we don't discipline them, and our future is limited when we're not disciplined. And that's why there's so much in Proverbs. This is kind of off-putting to some people, uh, what Proverbs has to say, because Proverbs 13, 24 is another example. Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. And there's people in our world that read that and say, oh, it just sounds like we're supposed to beat our kids all the time, you know. And, uh, you know, certainly I think the author of Proverbs is pro-corporal punishment. We spanked our kids when they were young and they're headed the wrong direction. But, but not all spanking is discipline and not all discipline is spanking, okay? Let, let's be clear about that. You know, we've all had that, you know, person on the next aisle in Walmart beating on their kids and, you know, and they're doing it out of frustration. They're not doing it for the child's good. They're just doing it to let off their steam. That, that's a parent that needs discipline themselves, you know. That's not, that's not discipline. Not all beatings are discipline. In fact, a lot of bad things happen in our culture because of domestic violence, that kind of thing. But, um, but not all, uh, 
you know, discipline's a bigger, bigger than just, I think when it says the rod, it's, it's, a, it's a metaphor for the larger realm of discipline. Discipline includes hugs, <laughs> conversations. Uh, discipline in, includes encouragement, showing how to make work fun. Discipline includes grace, forgiveness, high expectations. All these things play into uh, what we would call discipline, showing the right way and training in the right way. To discipline well, you have to be disciplined yourself. And God disciplines those he loves. Let's look at Proverbs 3, verse 11. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary in his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father of the son in whom he delights. So we need to learn to rejoice in the Lord's discipline in our life. Because if God loves you, he's going to discipline you. If, God, if God's invested in you, he's going to be shaping you. Uh, Jim Rohn, who is kind of a business philosopher, he's, he's uh, passed on now. But he said, we must all suffer from one of two pains. The pain of discipline or the pain of regret. The difference is discipline weighs ounces while regret weighs tons. So choose your pain. Life has pain. That's just part of it. Would you rather have the pain of discipline or the pain of regret? You're going to have one or the other. Um, most of the time we have to choose between the two. You know, I, I saw it ran across a list uh, recorded by nurses of people on the, in the last days of their life. They were asked the question, what's your greatest regret? Okay, I just thought I'd share some of these. I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself not what others expected of me. I wish I hadn't worked so hard. Nobody on their deathbed wishes they'd spent one more day at the office. I wish I had the courage to express my feelings. I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. I wish I had let myself be happier. I wish I spent more time with the ones I cared about. I wish I cared more about those who cared about me. I wish I was more present with my kids when they needed me the most. The order of life is God, family, and then business. I wish I had listened to my gut more. I wish I had followed my passion. You know, the pain of discipline is real, but it tends to a better life. The pain of regret is much deeper and heavier. You know, Les Brown said this, If you do what's easy, your life will be hard. If you do what's hard, your life will be easy. Think about that a minute. <laughs> a little counterintuitive, isn't it? If you do what's easy, your life will be hard. If you do what's hard, your life will be easy. If you walk in discipline, there's some, dis there's some restraints with that. But there's also such a release of such potential with that. <laughs> John Maxwell talks about, he's the kind of leadership guru guy. Some of you know John Maxwell, 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. He talks about discipline. And he says, discipline can never be for its own sake. You know, if you go around saying, I'm going to be disciplined. I'm going I'm, I'm to be disciplined, and then I'm going to be disciplined because I need to be disciplined. You'll always fail at that. Because discipline needs a why. Discipline needs a purpose. Discipline needs a goal. When you're disciplined, you see something bigger, a preferred future, and you edit your life in order to get there, okay? Discipline needs a why. That's a great insight because uh, just going around trying to make yourself disciplined is not the point. And that's why uh, we get to the most important relationship here as we close. And that's our relationship with Jesus Christ. You know what Jesus called his followers? He called them disciples. And disciple means a disciplined one. You know, some people think, well, I need Jesus because I need forgiveness. You do need forgiveness, and you do need Jesus' forgiveness and grace. You do need the cross. That's the first piece of what Jesus has to offer you. Uh, Jesus is our Savior, but then he becomes our, our Lord. And that's really the most exciting journey. You know, Jesus said in Revelation chapter 2, verse 17, to the one who's victorious, I'll give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. You know what that tells me? You don't even, I don't even know who I am apart from Jesus. Jesus holds my true self in his hand. And as I journey with Jesus, as I'm disciplined to follow Jesus, I unlock the person that God created me to be. And, and that's, the, that's the path of discipline. You know, following Jesus 
is a path of discipline. It, Jesus said it's a narrow way. It's uh, loving those who hate you. That's a narrow way. There's not a lot of crowds on the narrow way, you know. It's, it's pretty, the traffic's pretty clear, okay? Uh, you know, forgive those who have wronged you. Uh, turn the other cheek. It's a, it's a narrow way. But as we're shaped by the teachings of Jesus, uh, we become a disciplined one, and we unlock the person that God created us to be. Here's 1 Corinthians 1.30. It's because of him, Jesus, that you're in Christ Jesus, who has become for us, what? Wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. The person that God created us to be. That's found in Jesus. There's so much connection in, in the New Testament between wisdom and Jesus. And let's look over in, um, in um, Colossians chapter 2. Paul says, my goal is that they be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden what? All the treasures and wisdom and knowledge. In Christ, that's where wisdom and knowledge are to be found. And it's in following Him, being disciplined by Him, disciplined with Him, it's where we unlock newness of life. You know, we come from a long chain of fools. <laughs> Go back to Adam and Eve, uh, all the way through. You know, the, the story of the Bible isn't a story of a bunch of human heroes. It's a bunch of human failures being pursued by a holy and loving God. We, we come from a chain of fools, but Jesus is the chain breaker. And he came to get us on a different path, restore the image of God in us, and unlock the you that you were created to be. He's got a white stone with a name on it that nobody else knows, and that's your name. That you don't even know yet. Because Jesus holds a you in his heart that you can't even see yet. But he's going to help you unlock that as we walk with him. So I'm going to invite you to stand, please for the reading of, for the uh, prayer, and I want you to, uh, I want you to uh, talk to Jesus as I talk to Jesus. Do in your heart what I'm doing with my lips and say, Lord God, I thank you that wisdom and foolishness are, um, choices that you set before us. There are environmental factors, choices we make that lead to one or the other that we can choose the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. When we try to make our life easy, it gets hard. <laughs> when we are harder on ourselves, it gets easier. Jesus, I thank you that you call your followers disciplined ones. You discipline us not because you hate us, but because you love us. That you see something in us that we can't even see in ourselves. So we pray, Lord, that you'd break the long chain of fools that we're part of. Put us on your path. Help us to love you, serve you, and follow you. And we'll give you all the glory for that in Jesus' holy name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Well, God is crazy about you. If God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. If God had a wallet, your photo would be uh, in it. He sends you flowers every springtime, a sunrise every morning. He can live anywhere in the universe. He chooses your heart. What about that Christmas gift at Bethlehem, that Friday at Calvary? Don't they prove? He's crazy about you and me. Let's go in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And let's walk in love and walk in discipline. In Jesus' name.